Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Luis Cisneros. He's an assistant research professor, part of the Biodesign Center for Biocomputing, Security, and Society at ASU, Arizona State University. And we're going to talk about uh, cancer and his research. So, Luis, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, if you would, tell me about your research. Well, you know, what I can say is uh, it goes uh, a little bit like all over the place. I have a background in physics. I just started years ago in things that have to do with uh, theoretical physics and dynamical systems. I ended up like working in biology and now I'm pretty much just working in this, in this field. I, I guess the interest is mostly looking at the evolutionary aspects of cancer in the sense of you know, what different cells are interacting with each other and, and that sort of things, like taking an approach that, that is not only evolutionary, but also from the ecological point of view, in the sense of looking at the tissue as a, a, a let's say, an ecosystem of, of different cells that are interacting with each other. So okay. putting all this in sort of like a framework of evolution for treating, you know, the, the problem of cancer and trying to understand cancer as a system. At what point do you think it becomes a... Uh... A system or an ecosystem? Is it when it's a few cells that are cancerous or is it millions or billions? Or Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I will call it always a system. The uh, Sort of like the basis of the way of thinking that, that we have is that we want to look at a multicellular system, which is, you know, like any of us, for example, as a, really as a community of cells, right? So in that sense, we are already a system and uh, already an ecology, them, you know, ourselves. You know, like we are basically a community of multiple cells that are interacting with each other and cooperating with each other and that sort of things. So cancer is some a phenomenon that happens in the context of multicellularity and in this sense is part of a system or so sort of like a malice, a malice of the system or like a breakdown of the usual structure and, and regulations that make that system work in, in harmony and in, in the way that, that it's supposed to be. So you could argue that maybe like certain things will depend on the fact that maybe when they start out, there's not too many cells. For example, if a cancer is just like nascent cancer, it's just a few cells, but it will always be in the context of other cells that are already there. So it's, it's always a system that is interacting with something, you know, bigger or in, in, a, in some sort of like a context of, uh, you know, collective cells that are interacting. You think that... Um a group of cancer cells in a tumor act as a single unit and they act in coordination? Do they have a sense of uh, self versus other? They could definitely, but not only between them, but also in coordination with the host, which is in this case, in the case of cancer, the, the patient, you know, the person that is suffering from cancer. 
the problem with cancer is that it's not something that is separated from, from the person. It's cells from the person that are actually behaving in a bad way. So in that sense, I mean, we don't really draw that line. It's not really like, you know, like an infectious disease where you have like some other species, like cells or, you know, or organisms from other species that are like sort of like invading our bodies. It's our own body generating the cells. So the type of coordinations that you're mentioning, that that's something that could happen by simply like just co-opting the regular functions that normal cells might have because since we are a multicellular system, we are already something that has a lot of coordination in it. Like all the cells are cooperating and communicating with each other and doing things in coordination with each other. Sometimes the cancers might actually, you know, take advantage of these, you know, relationships and actually do that. Well, it's, it's, there's no, you know, it's not like it's taking advantage. It's the, there's no intention on anything. It's just that the type of biological functions that, that are driving cancer might already be taking advantage of the of this sort of functionality and sort of coordination that they have. So in, in that sense, yes, it might, it might actually be working well, if with all, if all cells, all living things have a homeostatic drive, why wouldn't there be intention? Why wouldn't at least on an individual level, each cell want to you know, maintain its states of preference? But what I'm asking is in concert, do they work together inside of a tumor, let's say, to what? advance the aims of the entire tumor? Do they all act in you know, like a biofilm together or an organ? Yeah, I mean... It's hard to, to a certain degree, it might, you know, like there's no, like cancer is not something that is doing any sort of things or functions in order to favor cancer. It's, it's favoring cancer cells. Like the cells are actually behaving as individuals or more and more. It depends, you know, like, you know, as I said, like they, they might take advantage that, that provide the cell some sort of advantage in the context where they are. But what is happening is that they start losing a little bit the, the sort of like constraints that they have to work in a multicellular system. And now they start like freeing themselves from those constraints and, and then they will actually behave more like unicellular organisms. I mean, cancer seems to have tropisms, you know, breast cancer tends to metastasize to certain sites and so do other cancers. And then when it metastasizes, yeah. it's not just like a shotgun of individual clumps of cells i mean it tends to be like metastases yes. of significant size so the cells not only go somewhere but they hang out in the same localized microenvironment and form other tumors you know metastases like yeah. why would they do that if they were acting individually there must be some coordination at least because because there's an advantage for the individual to do that i mean it, it, it's the same as a biofilm as you mentioned you know like cells in a biofilm they do cooperate with each other because this is a collective phenomenon but they're not necessarily, you know, like the, the unit of selection is not the biofilm. You know, they are doing this because there's some sort of like some, you know, like some sort of game in the sense of, you know, like evolutionary game theories. There's some sort of like sort of collective phenomena will actually bring, you know, like have a trade off that actually benefits all the individuals in the, in the collective. But the collective is not being selected for. There's no... You know, a like multicellular organism, we as individuals, like a, a person, me, myself, I will do things that favor me as a multicellular organism because I, as a person, is the one that is going to be reproducing in the biological sense. Whereas cells in a cancer tumor are doing things that might be collective, but they're not trying to bring up the advantage of the tumor. They're, they're bringing up the advantage of the, of the cells, it's just that it's convenient for everybody or well, for everybody in the tumor collective to do these things in a coordinated manner, you know, and, and, you know, and share a little bit, you know, like the, you know, like, you know, if you have a size then you might actually have more advantage. But I mean, even, even if there are, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity, but there still are clonal lineages. Yes. So you don't even think within a clonal lineage, it's like a competing clan to another clonal lineage. Yeah, for dominance in a tumor. I mean, when you know when they're exposed to chemotherapy, it seems like this. Uh, you know, the predominance changes in response to that. It's uh, not absolutely. just on an individual yeah. cell basis. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to twenty seven hundred plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. 
We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. And that is the basis of looking at this as, a, as an ecological system. You have multiple clades or of, of different types of cells that are doing different things. And But I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's not that there's no coordination. It's more like there are different ways to approach and, you know, that has to do with defining what is the unit of selection that you are doing. And for example, I mean, I could argue that a pack animals, you know, like wild horses running around in the, in the prayer, they might actually do things in collective because they run around together. And they do that because they want to, you know, like in, in a way that dilutes a little bit the risk that might have, uh, you know, like a predator, you know, hitting anyone, any one given of them, you know, for example, just, just one simple example of this. That doesn't mean that the collective of horses is, is a unit that is thinking of itself. It's, it's more like the horses cooperate with each other to benefit each other. But that doesn't make the pack to be a selective unit. You know, like you don't have a, the pack of wolves. Well, well, why not, though? I mean, if they don't hunt well together, then they don't eat. They don't reproduce. They don't continue on. So I don't because think there's any, any any privileged level of selection. I think it happens on many, many levels, it seems like. like yeah, of course. Like myself, I, I live in Texas, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm in Austin. So I have one allegiance to my family. I'm part of my family, but I'm also an Austinite. I'm also part of Texas. I'm also part of the United States. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm a, a podcaster, I'm also part of the Podcasters Association. So, I mean, why can't biological organisms have many different levels of association? And They absolutely do. But the, the difference is what the selective unit is. At the, at the moment of talking about, like, selection in the sense of, like, where, like, adaptations and and uh and evolution is acting upon this is this is sort of like a sort of thing like you can you can actually talk about that like, like a colony of ants for example as something like highly organized that, that is a that is what is technically called as an eu social system but it's not it, you cannot call that a multicellular organism you know even though you have highly like you know like levels of coordination so i mean some people call it a super organism yeah like you know i, I have all my my somatic cells, my germline cells, but then I have my microbiome. So, but I, I get all of it constitutes me, you know? So, I mean, my somatic cells, they don't just seem to die as frequently as uh, let's say my microbiome cells, you know, I can, I can take antibiotics and kind of wipe out my, my microbiome, but I still survive, but I yeah. can't do that with my somatic cells. So it just seems like there's different levels of, I don't know, organization, of coordination of all that stuff. So, even if it's a loose association, perhaps in cancer, there you know because of the cooperation, there is uh, there's emergent properties of it, and there's emergent selection possibly. The problem is that cancer doesn't really have a life beyond the life of the host. A cancer is a, is an example of a process in which you you might have all that sort of collective phenomena that, you, that you're talking about, like in, in some way. But there's two two distinctions that are very clear. One is that. Uh, cancer is emerging from something that is pre-existing that is, already has a good number of adaptations, specifically multicellular adaptations. So the cancer cells are actually taking advantage, or well, not taking advantage, but they're, they're basically using a bunch of machinery and, and, and functionality that is already there. And it's just basically rewiring stuff, okay? And then modifying the stuff that is pre-existing. And for the most part, it's actually destroying the stuff that is functional. And then by doing that, it's knocking down a bunch of regulations and then, you know, like giving opportunity to other things that are sort of like suppressed to actually take over more than anything. You know, sometimes you have new functionalities coming up, coming about with, with the mutational process. But for the most part, it's mostly just like knocking down regulations. And, uh, and on the other hand, whatever is happening within cancer has only relevance during the life of the person that it is, except for, you know, like probably, you know, a few cases of, of transmissible cancer that we know, you know, now it's, it's sort of like the new thing. And uh, then, then I would argue like, yeah, that's an example of a, of an actual 
you know, new emergent sort of like parasite type of, of organism that is capable of jumping from one individual to the other as a, you know, like using metastasis as a way of reproduction. But so far, like, uh, you know, like in the, in, in the sense of like conceptualizing like cancer as, um, even though I, I do, I mean, I do agree that technically it works as a, you know, some sort of like, you know, sort of emergent parasite within us, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go farther than that. You, it, it, so everything is happening in a very fast track. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. So when you talk about ecology of cancer, what do you mean? And what are some experimentations that you're looking at? I'm sort of thinking at the cellular level, you know, where we have. So now imagine that we have the tissue and the, the tissue ourselves, like a, a patient or a person, that individual, an animal that has cancer is the ecosystem. And what you have is cancer is the emergence of new species that might actually be invasive in this. So what you have is a lot of competition and a lot of, you know, competition for space, for resources, and for, you know, you have actual direct predation through things like, you know, like the immune system or or that sort of things. So we like to think of all this, like the evolution, the microevolution that is happening in, during the cancer progression as a process that is happening in the context of uh, an ecology of many cells. And then thinking about that in that in that sense, because that give us sort of like the a, a way of thinking of you know seeing cancer as m- more or less like a like some sort of inevitable situation in a in an ecological system, you know, where we have like cells will actually try to do things that that bring advantage to the cells. Now we lose a little bit the the context of you know what it, what it corresponds to be the healthy thing to do for the whole organism. You know, what we have is a conflict between multiple cells and some of them are acting in the homeostatic context to sort of like provide and supply for the survival of the organism, which is the person. And other cells will actually be like sort of fighting against that in their own favor. So, So there will be sort of like the rogue cells that will be sort of like the equivalent of rogue ants in a in a in a colony and that decide like they don't want to be workers anymore and then they just you know they, they're just going to do their own thing and then try to start reproducing themselves you know instead of just letting the queen be the only one that reproduces for example so you have that sort of co- uh, conflict between sort of like community and the individual and that is sort of like the the interface where we are thinking about okay how could there be a community if everyone's acting in their own in their own self-interest well, and, well, that's what collective behavior is. You you can actually realize that at some point uh, your self interest might be, you know, the the best thing to do will be to cooperate with others, and that might actually, even though that's cooperation, it, you might still find out that the best thing for you to do personally, individually, is to cooperate with others because there is an added advantage on the on the cooperation, and that's how like collective phenomena comes about an emergence comes about or you know like typical things on the you know like you know economic economic systems and things like that i don't know my my liver my pancreas doesn't really seem to have a mind of its own it seems to work in concert with my body and not really rebel against it for the most part so it seems like you know there's extensive coordination within cellular systems ex- super extensive and that is- would lead i would think to uh you know reacting to selection pressure if you're going to say that it's just you know Outside of the organ, yeah, outside are, of the tissue, but those are the normal cells, right? Right, but what's so different about cancer cells? I mean, they're still cells, so why couldn't they have the abilities of regular cells too and form their own ecology? Well, the, the regulations are things that are coded in the DNA and uh, and the behavior that individual cells have, and eventually you and they're mostly coordinated by interactions between all the different cells and, and signals that are shared around you know, like things like, you know, like regulatory factors and and growth factors and, you know, like hormones and, you know, that sort of things. And cells are, through evolution, they're programmed to respond to all these signals in a way that brings advantage to the whole organism. That is where the selective unit comes about. Like all those signals that we have that are sort of making all the cells of our body to be coherent with each other interest of our advantage as a community 
are just working in that way. You know, we, you know, evolution will actually drive all this to you know different cells to to be regulated and to be suppressed to do certain things in that way. And then, at, but at some point, you you could actually modify or get modifications in particular cells that that will break down this relationship. Like they might not listen to the signals as well as they should, or they might not you know, have the capacity to uh, respond in a particular way anymore because they acquired a specific mutation that doesn't, you know, that knocks down that specific program. So now uh, they are sort of like free of their regulations and then they start behaving a little bit like individuals. And that's where cancer starts emerging. So what have you uh, been able to figure out about cancer with your, you know, uh, viewpoint? I mean, I guess uh, the whole point is that we view cancer as a breakdown of multicellularity in that exact sense. You know, like we have all the regulations. What happens with cancer is that cells start like for, you know, there's many different ways in, in which this can happen. They start like knocking down these sort of programs. And w- one of the, the things that we have seen is that cancer itself could be uh, a stress response. You know, when certain cells like acquire certain types of damage, they might actually, I mean, there's a part when, when a cell accumulates damage in the DNA specifically, they have the capacity to either decide if they want to arrest the, the life cycle and then repair the damage that they acquired, you know, like a specific if it's a, like a mutation in the DNA or something. They might actually not, you know, like, you know, sort of a stop and then, and then try to fix that. In some of the cases, they might actually just go ahead, realize that the damage is not too serious and then just go ahead and just keep it, you know, like just don't mind it and then just go ahead with the cell cycle and then actually pass out to the descendants when if, if their cells that are reproducing, pass out to their descendants like that sort of damage in a form of a mutation. This is more or less just to put it in a, in a very simplistic way. Sometimes that decision, and in, in some of the cases, there's some cells that have a damage that will realize that the damage is too serious and they cannot be fixed. So they will actually commit suicide. And this is one of the, you know, sort of like a big, you know, regulation programs that, that we have in cells. Like the cells do commit suicide when they, when they realize that they're, you know, basically too damaged or they, they could actually be a liability for the large organism. So what might happen is that in, in certain contexts, when, uh, when the damage happens in a certain way on, in, in, under certain conditions, the cells might actually choose or opt not to go to the suicide program and actually just accumulate the damage and, and then just go ahead and, and, and continue their life and then accumulate the damage, that could come about as a, as, as a way to respond to stress. You know, in, in, in unicellular life for bacteria, for example, you, you see organisms that are single cell organisms that are capable of doing this. And not only they have the capacity to accumulate the damage, but also they crank up the or or are more permissive of allowing the patients to accumulate this in return actually accelerate the rate of mutations for the cells which could actually favor like accelerated evolution you know because you have more mutations you accumulate you you have a faster way to get out of the situation of course that's those are sort of like risky you know things to do because you you are accumulating damage you know like this is more likely that actually accumulate something detrimental than not. But these are the sort of things that are happening in cancer. We have specific molecular signatures that actually indicate this. This is known in in bacterial populations. It's called the SOS response. And we find that specific signature in in cancer cells. So in essence, what cancer cells are doing is trying to evolve away from a situation of stress that that is causing damage. That sort of things actually, as we age in are more likely to happen, you know, like uh, they, there's some sort of trade-off that have to do with like how, how much capacity we have to regulate and police cells that are trying to do this in our bodies. But uh, as we age, we have less capacity to do that. So they, we were more likely to accumulate cells that are going through this process. But more importantly, in practical sense, this is very important to take into account because these cells are already sort of prime to to evolve faster as you expose them to stress. And that is exactly what we're doing when we, uh, you know, like 
expose them to chemotherapy, for example, or any sort of like therapy that we use to treat cancer. So the, the idea is to actually be a little bit more aware of the evolutionary process that is happening in during the cancer progression in order to be more informed about how far we can go with the treatments that we go. Because in many cases, we might end up selecting cells that are actually more aggressive. By, by trying to cure the cancer, we might actually be, be making the, uh, you know, the situation a little bit worse because we might, might end up like selecting. Well, I don't know about might. I mean, it definitely seems to. Very regularly after chemotherapy, the colonial lineages will change and the cancer will come back across many different yeah. cancers. So I think it's pretty, uh, pretty substantiated that it does exactly that. Yeah, exactly. There's different ways and that could be done in a way that to sort of like confuse the system in ways. Because the problem is, is that if you expose uh, the cells to a specific chemotherapy that is too uh, aggressive and you don't kill the whole population, you have exactly the same problem that you have with, a, you know, with an infection you know, and antibiotics. You, know? you end up like you end up selecting selecting a resistant a resistance strain and then you're you're posed because then the, there's nothing you can do against that you know like once you select that and the key is that uh, typically the resistant uh, strains are less fit than the ones that are that are sensitive to the drugs because they have to use additional resources to actually uh, maintain that the mechanisms to to sustain the the resistance so you want to basically play with the populations, you know, and this is like, I guess, in terms of the, the, my line of work and the, you know, like the sort of things that, that we're trying to like wrap up together with all the different projects that, that we have in, you know, in different, looking at things in different ways is to actually bring this about, like in, in the sense that we want to actually have, instead of trying to cure cancer, we want to actually manage it. You know, we want to be able to monitor like how the progression of the cancer of the tumor is and actually adjust the particular therapy that we have. Essentially treating cancer as a chronic disease more than just something that you need to kill, you know? In that sense, like, yeah, in some cases, every cancer is completely different. Every patient will be, will be completely different. So this is sort of like a very personalized approach. But the idea is to think of this is a system that is evolving, that is going to adapt uh, you know, and basically find, figure out a way to get out of whatever we throw at it. So if we start with that assumption, say like, we're not going to be able to kill it, we're not going to be able to, all what we need to do is, is sort of control it, then at, at the end of the day, this might actually give us you know, much better opportunities to, for example, not select for something that is too aggressive, also extend the life of a patient with a much higher life you know, like uh, quality. How would you know how a cancer would react to any how, given therapy? If it's heterogeneous, how would you establish how it would react? Well, usually... Like the intermodeling of every cell or what? what yeah, we have, uh, we have models that we're trying to do, but the idea is to turn the whole thing into a very sort of like dynamic process where you, every time you do something, you know, you try a, a specific drug, you keep track of how that drug, you know, what is the effect of that drug? So, and, and this is this is an strategy called adaptive therapy, which is something that we are like, uh, working a lot on, and particularly with with modeling, but also we have some experiments and, and trials that were. The idea is you, and at this point, is just you know the experiments are with mice, but the idea is like okay, you have a mouse that that have a, a tumor, and then you try a specific drug like a chemotherapy. Okay, and you typically will see that the tumor like shrinking uh, after the after applying the the drug. Eventually, if you keep doing it, eventually you will see it bouncing back. You know, like the, the tumor is going to start growing back. And then, you know, essentially one of the simple things that you can do is to at that point when you see that that the tumor start responding in a negative way, meaning that it, it doesn't care anymore about the drug, you s- switch to a different drug. And then, you know, it's, you can maintain it down. And then maybe by doing this, what you do is balance out, like you just play a little bit with the, the populations, the different populations or, or subclones of, of the tumor that, that are sensitive and resistant to different drugs. And then they balance each other as a, you know, like a, some sort of like, you know, like if you were playing with different, you know, like a population of, you know, of, of different things that, that react 
you know, to, to different foods or, or resources that you give them. And you are, you are trying to keep the balance. So, so by, by switching the drugs, you actually like start killing the other ones that are start like, you know, fix it, getting fixated in the population. And then you do that again. And then, you know, like you see all the oscillations, but you have to be monitoring the, the tumor all the time. You know what I mean? This is like an adaptive uh, therapy, you know, like a, you, need, you need to have the, the capacity to, to look at the progression of the tumor uh, as you and see the effects of the therapy that you're using. So you don't really need to know a priori how the tumor is going to react to something that you do. You just basically try it and then see how what happens to it. And usually, I mean, this doesn't sound very any different than what's going on right now, I guess. They're looking at cocktails of drugs and the it, drug. I mean, it doesn't seem to be any different from what's happening. What, what, what would be the innovation in this? The difference is that for the most part, the standard of care nowadays is to try to eliminate the tumor. So essentially what they do is they, they give you a concentration of the drug that is essentially what they call the maximum tolerance doses. These drugs are literally poisonous. You know, they're like, they're really, really bad for you. What they do is they, they figure out what is the maximum tolerance that you have to a specific drug, and then they just move it now down a notch. So they're basically just giving you the, uh, as much as they can without killing you. The idea with this strategy is to actually use the minimum amount of drug because we want to minimize the toxicity on the patient. So we try to work with the minimal effective dosage instead of the maximum tolerance. So you just give as little as you have to in order to see a reaction from the tumor. That way you reduce the toxicity and then you switch back and forth between, you know, like you, you, like the, the frequency of switching things around is, is a lot higher. And then there's a, a lot of different strategies that you can do, like, you know, like you can switch one from the other or give vacation or use both in cocktail. Like those are, you know, like the, all the different strategies that you can do in, in the ways in which you combine all the different things are, you know, part of, a, of the question that, of what we're trying to figure out, you know, you know to, to figure out like if there is a way to optimize the strategy in order to guarantee that response. I mean, haven't people focused on this to optimize it or they just, I mean, what, what stopped mm -hmm. this from happening? Well, I mean, this, this is actually all very recent. The, so far, what is, what is being done is mostly they give you a drug until it doesn't work anymore and then they switch it to another one. But with a, in, a, in a very long time. And there's always the sort of like the focus is to try to kill the cancer, okay, to get rid of it. So, so they basically just try to reduce it. And uh, eventually they, I mean, they may stop it if they detect that the level of toxicity that a patient has is too high. So they might actually stop. You know, well, they will certainly stop there. What is not being done is actually try to do this in a sort of like optimal way. Well, why is it just "quote unquote" too hard, or what, um, what would be the reason? It can't be systematized, or what's you know? That's a good question. I think it's a question of culture. It's where we, in in the sense of the philosophy or the policy of a standard of care, when we are focusing on killing the cancer, then you want to go hard on it as soon as you can, and the hope is that you you kill it like very soon, and then the patient is done. You know, like it's it's cured basically. It just doesn't make sense that, you know, the medical industry would go on hope for decades yeah. and, you know, have, have the same effect where a lot of, you know, a lot of, it depends on the cancer situation, but, you know, some of them it very readily comes back and reliably comes back. I just don't know. I, I know you can't answer it, but I just, it just doesn't make sense why uh, they keep doing the same thing and it's, it's just not working. And they're measuring yeah. improvements in terms of like six weeks of addition, additional lifetime where it's, uh, you know, not even a good quality of life. So. I just, I don't know. I just don't know what the excuses are, why they haven't uh, tried to optimize this. I guess one of the problems is um, that I could come with, because I agree with you. I mean, once you, you realize this, it's like, well, why, why is this not being done? One of the big issues is uh, liabilities. Typically, like, uh, uh, it's really, uh, there's a really sensitive point in which uh, when a doctor has to decide what to do about a patient, it turns into a really delicate point to argue for doing something to the patient that is not intended to kill the the tumor altogether, you know, like, you know, like do something that you know is not necessarily going to kill the, the cancer on the hopes that you can, uh, you know, after that continue to do something else and then that, that is going to work. 
there's always the, the uncertainty. Say like, okay, well, but if you don't kill it, then, you know, it might come back and, you know, it will still be there. So you are not doing your best to try to cure the cancer. And there's, uh, there's a little bit of this argument, kind of like, it, it turns into like a little bit of complicated point. So you, you need to have like very sound and very solid evidence showing that this is the, the actual best strategy that you can do for any patient in order to actually have that to be considered to be a new standard of care. And yes, like, I mean, this is, this is what we're trying to do. That's why we have trials and things like, let's just learn to manage it. And at some point, we, for, for the strategies that we're thinking about, you have to actually be able to accept that a patient is going to live with cancer for the rest of their life. And it's going to be like a patient that has diabetes, you know, or some sort of autoimmune disease that a person will have to deal with the cancer. And then we have just like, you know, we have, we have to have like some sort of like appeal or some sort of like therapy that you live with it. And then you just keep monitoring the patient. You know, and then, you know, like, of course, depending on the on the outcome that you have, you might have to like have more or less frequency of, you know, new new therapy things. That's something a little bit delicate. You know, when you have a patient with cancer tell you like, no, like you're, you're telling me that you're going to like keep the cancer alive in me. Like, why, why is that? Like, it's, it's going to kill me, you know, and that's that that takes a little bit of time to sort of, you know, like there's many, many chronic conditions, so, you know, if. Yeah, the patients will do whatever they're being told is what's supposed to happen. You know, they're being mm-hmm. told to have poison right now, chemotherapy. So if they're being told that congratulations, you're not going to die, but it'll be a chronic condition you live with forever. That's far better, mm-hmm. yep. I would think. And people have heard that many times with all kinds of autoimmune diseases and everything. So, I mean, why is it so different? I guess it's because cancer is one of those things that is so scary for so many people, and and everybody's been touched by it. And um, I guess it's, it's it's one of those things that is just you know in our psyche it's, it must be i mean i i, I always um just as a, as a reference i my my mom actually had cancer my, my mother died of cancer a few years ago and i was going through this like knowing very well all this stuff that we're discussing and it was really hard for me to actually think of you know like risking trying things differently than what the doctors have as a standard of care it is like, uh, you know, when, when you are at the point where you have to actually make the decisions and say like, okay, the, you know, the life of my mother is on, in the line, you know, what, yeah. what shall we do? Then, you know, you start like kind of like second guessing everything. And so I guess this is why it's important that all this kind of research have more support and more like solid evidence, because then we will be able to say like, well, it's not only you know, some sort of theory that some geeks are coming out with, like that talk about evolution is an actual, you know, like we have actual proof that this is how we should do it. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. My mom did too. And she passed mm-hmm. away as well. So I understand. And mm-hmm. I've had cancer myself too, thyroid. And when you, mm-hmm. uh, when you have it, yeah, you're afraid you're going to die right then. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to see clearly and think clearly. So I, I understand. Well, very good. Um, Luis, what's the best way for people to learn more about your research? Where can they go? Me specifically, probably the um, things like LinkedIn and, and, you know, like my, my webpage in the, at the ASU. But there's also, like, I, I work in the lab for a very um, bright researcher called Carlo Miley that, is, that works here at the ASU. And uh, his webpage is actually very, very, very good for this kind of thing. Yeah, I know Carlo. He's a very good guy. Yeah. So, and uh, I also have good collaborations uh, with Paul Davis, who also here is here at the ASU and, uh, mm-hmm. and the Beyond Center. And you know, well, I heard he's with... stuck in he's stuck in Australia, but he may come back soon, right? Exactly. A, a lot of my work has been in you know in collaboration with uh, the two of them and and Kim Bossy. Uh There's also the page, the web page of uh, Athena Atikis, which is uh, you know like a, a, an actual theoretical biologists that work in this okay. kind of stuff, uh, for, you know, specifically in the relationship between multicellularity and cancer. Well, very good, Luis. Thank you for coming on the podcast, and I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? 
Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.